Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I would like to welcome you to our third March Rap meetup with uh, Anida Mumic. Um, we will start recording now. I will not take much of your time. I'll give it straight to Anida. Anida, are you ready? We will have all the materials ready after the meetup, right, Slavice, and send it yeah. to all participants. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say like a few things before we officially start. I know that everyone is like uh, ready for Anida, but I I think that we want to give them Anida's background. Actually, Anida, can you actually tell us something about your background, about your career? Where do you come from? And uh, what is your experience with the topic uh, you will present us? Yeah, thanks girls. Um, okay, for everybody who don't know after so many <laughs> posts from my company, <laughs> my name is Anida. Uh, I work as service delivery manager. Um, actually, I started up as project manager, but I think the role evolved into whatever it is called today. Um, I'm an electrical engineer uh, by profession, but I accidentally ended up in project management. Um, I remember that one day I couldn't sleep for four days <laughs> when I had to make decision to go <laughs> into this direction, but I don't feel sorry about it because that actually determined uh, what I really like to do now and what is my passion. Um, I have uh, this year, actually, I'll be turning 10 years of experience in telecommunications and IT industry. Um, I have had uh, the honor to lead and serve a lot of different teams in different organizations. Uh, so working on different kind of projects, such as infrastructure projects to optimizing and uh, actually creating processes and uh, uh, lately uh, building products. And also I have worked in functional organization, metrics organization, project ties and whatnot. So ever. Um, today I will be actually talking about one of the my greatest experiences I've had uh, recently uh, working on a project in, in Symfony. Um, actually the whole topic of how to get to high performing cross-functional teams. Um, I, I, I will share with you some of my insights actually, um, but some of the things that are applicable, I believe to any of the team, not just cross-functional uh, IT development team, call it whatever. That's, so, that's yeah. definitely, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that introduction. That's amazing experience. Like I can't wait to hear uh, your presentation. We were we had a dry run yesterday. And uh, as I mentioned before we officially started, I was looking at some of your slides and I, I was telling, I need this in my job. So <laughs> definitely it's going above the scope of service delivery manager. And I can't wait to see everything. Uh, before you actually start, I know that everyone is ready for you. Uh, I just want to say a few things uh, for those who maybe attended some of our previous uh, March It Up events. They already know what I'm talking about, but I just want to explain the flow of this event. Um, after Anita's presentation, we will have a Q&A section. Uh, and as you already know, we are really nurturing knowledge sharing, not only in, uh, in our organization, but externally. So use that opportunity to speak to us, to ask questions, and Anita will be uh, ready to answer all of them. Uh, so uh, you have three ways to communicate with us. Uh, you can do it during the presentation all the time uh, in our chat box. So feel free to ask anything you want or just to uh, share your experience or something you notice during presentation. Uh, so that will be like fluid uh, way to talk to us. Uh, please use Q&A uh, section uh, at the bottom of your, of your screen for technical questions. Uh, Anita will be uh, mostly focused there to answer your questions, so please use, use that for technical ones. Also, we are encouraging you to speak to us directly. So uh, please, when you want to speak to us and ask questions uh, directly, speak up, uh, please raise a hand. And then I will see that you raise a hand and allow, allow you to talk so you can speak to us. Um, that would be it. That's like an official part which I need to cover. I will not take uh, much of your time. So Anida, the stage is yours, please. <laughs> continue with your presentation. Thanks a lot. Okay, so sharing my screen. Um, okay. 
So you can see my screen, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, super. Um, so, okay, uh, as I said, I will talk about some of the applied practices on one of our biggest projects in the company. Um, I will not go into the details of the project itself because it is under the NDA, but I will give my best to provide some insight into uh, how we did things, what were our challenges and uh, how we resolved them. Um, how we actually managed to have a team of more than 30 people feel like they're one team and at the same time that don't they don't feel the burden of a large team uh, that every large team actually brings uh, uh, in, oh, every, everything that gets overwhelming when you have a lot of people in one, one place uh, so I will talk uh, about um, setup of cross-functional teams um, how we did it in in, in our project. Uh, then I will talk about some of the processes and uh, challenges. And uh, last but not least important people, uh, actually people are the most important part here, but uh, that, that will be a little bit uh, longer um, part of the talk. Uh, so first thing I will talk about uh, team setup. Um, for the folks who have a crush on organizational setup, such as myself, uh, we are a project-based organization. So uh, building teams around projects uh, great, comes with great benefits of projectized organization. Um, however, as I said, majority of the tidbits I will be talking about today are applicable to any uh, organization. Uh, and from my experience, actually uh, managing and uh, leading teams in different kinds of organizations, uh, these are some things that really work. Um, so according to a theory that was uh, two decades uh, old, around two decades old, um, ideally the cross-functional team is a small group of uh, key players um, who are chosen uh, from their uh, functional area, so carefully chosen uh, for their skills and uh, who are committed to a common goal and overall mutually accountable for the uh, team success. Um, the composition of uh, cross-functional teams in practice uh, isn't always ideal, which brings to, um, which is actually contributing to some of the challenges in, in the project's uh, implementation. Uh, so, uh, next thing, um, I will talk about uh, the setup of our team. Uh, so, when I joined my, uh, my dearest project, um, it was actually uh, second half of the very big release. Uh, we had around 30 people who were working on cup, uh, over of uh, who were working for a couple of months already under a pressure of delivering MVP uh, with a very packed scope and a tight timeline. And um, that MVP was more than just an MVP. So we had to prove the value uh, and reasoning actually for swapping the old application that client used. And later it would turn out to be that this was the initial driver for their digital transformation and, and actually how they do business. Um, so huge scope, tight timeline. And uh, actually when we were entering uh, the last month of delivery, the whole world went into a lockdown. <laughs> Um, our people with their strong sense of ownership and commitment were actually doing extra hours delivering this uh, scope and uh, actually successfully delivering the scope. So not whining about what the bad things are happening and watching Netflix and being not productive. Actually, it was on the contrary. Uh, the team was really successful in, in uh, delivering this MVP. Uh, but um, actually, after we figured out what we have done, uh, we also understood that the way the team was working and the people are working uh, is not sustainable, that uh, if we keep uh, people in the same setup uh, and uh, actually continue uh, delivering in such way, the whole project would be in jeopardy. Uh, from the client side, we actually proved that we can do this and we, we really needed to reorganize and figure out some way how do we lead the teams and how do we manage, manage the entire project further on. Um, at that time, we had around 26 people from uh, Symphony, so uh, people from two hubs, Sarajevo and Belgrade, and we had a whole bunch of people, you name it, <laughs> uh, developers, uh, front-end, back-end, full-stack, QAs, uh, DevOps, um, um, uh, Scrum Master, uh, Technical Architect, uh, Proxy Product Owner, and Service Delivery Manager. And from client side, we had around seven people who were involved in development on a daily basis. So from uh, client management side, um, 
their program manager and uh, product director, uh, as well as product owners and design team. Um, so um, at that time, we also had kind of a feeling where people were under pressure and thinking about uh, we delivered whatever we had to deliver and uh, we're kind of, you know, we are only the team. So we are, you know, under pressure. We are the team people figuring out who is their own in that situation. Um, our QA were part of the, like, we're actually team for themselves. Our DevOps were team for themselves. Delivery people were like them. <laughs> and everybody else was the team. Um, so what we figured out that we had to change that kind of uh, feeling and uh, how, how we started was actually by uh, splitting the team into uh, three feature-based cross-functional teams. So uh, developers and uh, QAs were split into the teams where we had um, a team each consisting of some backend, some front-end, some full-stack and a QA engineer. Uh, with each of that team having a team lead who was the tech lead actually for everybody in the team, uh, not just for, uh, for the front end or for the back end uh, um, engineers and everybody else. So all the other roles, uh, DevOps, uh, delivery architect, uh, product owners, designers, everybody else. Uh, we're actually a, a team and the, we were providing support and guidance for, for these three uh, feature-based teams. So we were all parts of the one team who, who were pushing things forward. Um, the teams, as I said, are, uh, were actually meant to be feature-based, uh, which um, has its own challenges in actually managing the capacity and utilization. Uh, but I will talk about that uh, a little bit later in, the, in one of the next slides. Uh, so why in the first place do we want uh, cross-functional teams? Uh, why, why do we go into this direction? Um, from the theory of cross-functional teams, uh, we have them because their use of decision-making and action producing processes, action producing processes actually uh, help to speed up the overall cycle time. Uh, this is done by reducing uh, sequential knowledge transfer activities, uh, reducing rework, improving uh, the flow of communication, and increasing the knowledge within the cross-functional teams. Uh, some popular uses for cross-functional teams uh, are actually to develop a total quality culture, uh, to re-engineer some of the existing processes, uh, to improve product and uh, service quality, to uh, reduce cycle time, to improve customer uh, relationship, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what we wanted to actually uh, achieve uh, with, with splitting the teams. So the first thing was actually to uh, increase knowledge sharing within the small teams. <clears throat> um, the next thing, uh, we wanted to have a strong focus on, on, sing, on single feature because uh, as we said, uh, teams were uh, feature-based and uh, the, if one team had a focus on one feature, uh, we would actually have better understanding of the whole feature and uh, especially on the fact that uh, we had QAs within the team who, were, uh, who needed to understand the business logic better and transfer all that knowledge to the team. Uh, we wanted to improve quality of uh, delivery and uh, increase the automation test. Uh, so uh, now, as I said, uh, developers were working with QA uh, at all times. And um, we, we actually wanted to uh, leverage uh, that uh, we, from each, each of the teams. Uh, we also wanted to uh, in increase the team ownership over everything that they are doing. First of all, over their single tickets, over their own feature, uh, and overall for the entire application. On top of that, uh, we wanted to increase the team engagement. Um, as I said, we had kind of a trouble after a long release to, to uh, get the engagement where we wanted to have it. Uh, and also what we figured that in this uh, bunch of uh, 30 people, uh, we had really um, a lot of noise in communication. So we had to uh, make something better out of it. Um, we also wanted to increase the visibility of processes and metrics as uh, we had some of the metrics uh, that were imposed on team and something, some things that we were actually 
measuring in their performance. And we really wanted to, uh, for everybody to understand what, what and how we are measuring things so that they understand why are we doing any changes. Uh, and overall, any change that has been done, so including the team split and, and the overall goal, uh, goal uh, we had to be transparent about it and, and pass it on to the team. And uh, the last thing, well, after this uh, big release was uh, completed uh, and we, we proved kind of that we can do anything that we, that we have to do, uh, we wanted to leverage that and actually improve further our relationship with the client by providing them more value from, from our delivery. This was the slide of your life, Slavica. <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs> I was amazed by that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, as I said, this was not applicable only to IT development team, but to any team uh, probably out there. Uh, so next, I will talk about uh, some of the challenges and uh, processes and how we actually manage to overcome uh, these challenges and, and get to our goals. So uh, just to give you a little bit context of uh, how we do things, um, we, for the framework, we actually have something that is highly customized for, for, customized for our needs. Uh, we, have, we actually use uh, Scrum just as a frame, which is highly customized to fit our needs. Um, something, taken, uh, something is taken from safe, something is taken from less. Uh, we're, we're also using Kanban and combining with the Scrum um, and something even from Waterfall. So we are not really uh, set in stone with any of the frameworks. Uh, we have two-week sprint uh, with Scrum ceremonies per each team. Uh, we have a release plan in advance and somehow we uh, put up the pieces all together in, in that release. Um, our planning process goes in a way that uh, product owners provide a, a product roadmap. Uh, they prioritize features for, in example, the next release. Um, features uh, are going to a technical architect who does the sizing, t-shirt sizing, etc., and uh, figures out all kind of dependencies and where are the major changes in the infrastructure and, and what else we have to do. Um, after the initial sizing is done, uh, team is going into grooming together with product owners, and then the teams uh, sit together, uh, provide uh, estimates for, for the future, and commitment actually to when something can be done. And that's about, like in short, our planning process. <sighs> okay, so some of the challenges we, we really faced at the moment when we split the team. Uh, first of all, uh, was uh, the same code base. Um, after delivering the MVP, everybody else would have to continue to work on the same uh, code base. And as we said, three teams uh, working uh, feature-based, working on one code base. So the challenge for us was actually how to share the knowledge of what every other team is doing. Um, how do we keep track of uh, dependencies? Um, how are any major changes in the infrastructure impacting other teams? Um, and, you know, a, a lot of questions here. Um, what really helped us uh, at this time is that we had backend team actually sticking together like one team uh, in a way that uh, actually the communication is uh, very transparent and it's shared. And um, whatever is happening in one of the teams related to any feature, any significant change in the infrastructure, an example, adding a new microservice, uh, that would be communicated uh, between the entire backend folks and uh, transferred on to the front end part. So everybody would transfer that to their own um, cross-functional uh, small team. And from the front end side, we had people uh, actually reviewing each other's uh, pull requests giving comments and kind of um, sharing the knowledge between, uh, between the three of the teams. Uh, what also helped us is that uh, Solution Architect is the kind of the uh, technical owner of everything that's happening uh, in, in, in the uh, actual in development. And uh, together with tech leads, he, he is the one who is discovering 
uh, all the dependencies, all the changes, and uh, he, he's actually keeping track of that uh, and communicating that transparently to uh, everybody else, all of, all of the three teams. <clears throat> The next thing we had a challenge was actually automation. So after we delivered this uh, large MVP, uh, large scope, um, we actually didn't have uh, any automation. So zero automation tests. Um, that's when we actually had to change uh, the way how we um, utilize the QA um, capacity in our project and had to uh, change slightly the way how we do things from engineering to actually people management part of the, the processes. Um, for, for the automation, actually to increase the, the automation, we had to um, give back some of the ownership of testing to developers. So we took into account when doing estimations, we took into account all the effort needed to uh, actually test uh, the tickets. So every developer after uh, completing the code, actually after merging it to, to any of the environment, he was also responsible to um, test whatever they were doing. And uh, QA engineers were actually in parallel working on uh, automation, building automation. And um, for the manual part, they were only involved in the regression. So after, uh, after we have, actually before the feature is released to, to production, we have uh, testing phase where they were actually doing uh, regression together with automation regression. Uh, and this actually helped us. It was kind of a change in the process, in, in delivery process. Uh, and um, this was one of the, the key things that helped us um, get to the point where we are today and have some automation along the way. Uh, okay, so the next thing, uh, the challenge was actually roles and responsibilities. So as I said, some of the things that we, some of the changes in processes were reflecting a lot on people. Um, at some point, as one of the first actually uh, things that we had to work on is that our tech leads were uh, leads to front end, back end, and QA, and they didn't have like all of these skills. So we had to do some kind of upskill and uh, raise transparency of the, over whatever, whatever everybody was doing in the team. Um, we had large support here from uh, our um, engineering, head of software engineering actually, and uh, HR um, actually to uh, understand what are um, um, actually uh, some of the um, individual development uh, plans, what, what we need to work on further and through uh, uh, through feedback session with a lot of people, we actually managed to um, get this done. So uh, yeah, with a lot of people, a lot of feedback sessions, <laughs> a lot of effort there, but um, great job done. Um, yeah, so one team, <laughs> this was also one of the challenges. As I said, uh, we didn't have that uh, kind of feeling where everybody was part of the one team. It was, um, them as clients or you people as service delivery or um, us as, as us as a team. Um, and we really had to work on this. So in a way that everybody feels like part of the team. Um, how we managed to do that is actually by providing more transparency of the whole process of restructuring team. Uh, what what are cha uh, the changes in the process? Uh, what, what are risks? What are expectations. So all of these things were, uh, were communicated transparently to everybody on the project. And uh, along the way, we actually managed to pull the client into the team as well. Uh, so whatever changes we were doing, we were actually transparently communicating this to the client. And uh, we actually managed to provide the value along the way. And they also uh, were really involved in, in everything that was going on. We had a great support from their side. That, that's the first uh, thing that, that was the most important. Um, and they were really ready to listen and to, to uh, provide us their support along the way. So um, I think one of the, the biggest uh, achievements uh, here was uh, when we had the client saying, uh, we really appreciate what everybody else is doing. We really feel like we are one team. 
And the, when actually people from the team, from, from Symphony, from our side were coming and saying, oh, this product owner is doing great stuff. They're providing great answers and, and help along the way. So I believe that uh, this is a great tool, actually, when you get to this feeling that um, everybody is one team, uh, this is a great tool to use uh, further on for, for everybody who's uh, doing uh, whatever my job is. Uh, you can use it um, to, to resolve any impediment, anything that comes on your way, uh, because as long as we are one team, we will uh, resolve anything, I think that is the most powerful, powerful thing. Okay, uh, so the next thing we had uh, a challenge with actually putting up together uh, release. And actually this is a challenge from release to release. Uh, we really wanted to keep these, uh, these teams small in a way that uh, whatever comes next, we try to, to keep the teams the same no matter what happens in, in, in the release. So imagine if you're, if you, the next, uh, an example, the next feature that comes to one team is more front end or back end heavy, and you have a um, range of uh, possibilities you can do there, how you can utilize the team. Uh, but actually, what really helped us here in this situation is that uh, after getting all the priorities from product owners and um, you know, everything we try to put up together in one release, uh, we discussed with them uh, through a lot of uh, actually sessions, uh, how to maximize the delivery over time. And um, this is kind of a <laughs> challenging work, um, but um, overall, if, if people are ready for, for discussion and ready and open to, uh, to, uh, to hear something uh, different, to hear whatever you are trying to do, um, from our from our perspective, uh, the client was really uh, having a lot of understanding here, and we managed to to do that. So that this was like three or four releases up until this moment, and um, I can tell you that this this works really well. Oh, communication. <laughs> so as I said, um, we use Scrum as uh, as as a high high level framework. Uh, so we have all of the meetings uh, that come together with Scrum. So all the dailies, all the uh, retrospectives, uh, sprint plannings, uh, whatever. We have a demo all together uh, sitting in front of the client, all, all the teams showing what they have done uh, over, that, uh, over that sprint. And uh, on top of that, we have a lot of scheduled other meetings um, to help us track, keep track of everything that we are doing. Uh, we have um, separate sync with uh, QA engineers uh, to figure out where they are standing, if they need any help or support. Uh, we have, so this was kind of like really needed after we transformed the teams in a way that, that we have to keep track of what the QA team was doing and actually to keep track mostly on automation where we're standing with that, because that was one of our goals uh, for the project. Um, we also had uh, meetings of technical discovery where architects would sit, sit uh, together with DevOps and uh, product owners to talk about technical um, issues. And even to, to f when, uh, when we are actually planning the new release, those meetings were actually uh, used for um, <sighs> t-shirt sizing and, and answering those kind of questions related to new features. Um, also on top of that, we have kind of a meeting uh, with um, all the team leads. So delivery versus delivery and, and team leads sitting together, discussing processes and what we can improve further on our project, how everybody is feeling, uh, getting some feedback on, on how things are working, etc. And well, actually, um, and on top of that, yeah, we had also daily meeting with the client. So as they are in another time zone, uh, we, were have, we are having four times a week also meetings with them. So yeah, a, a lot of meetings really. <laughs> um, but um, on top of these scheduled meetings and some things that we must do, um, we actually have a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. And I've, actually when we figured out that um, the that we are not going back to whatever was normal before the, the pandemic. Uh, we figured out that we even need to increase the communication 
uh, even more. And um, on top of these scheduled meetings, we also had a lot of, uh, lot of meetings, one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with the team uh, members, um, just to understand how things are working. Um, I will talk about this later when I, when I start to talk about, <laughs> about our people. <sighs> so people, yeah. In Symphony, we really value our people. Um, I think this is the key pillar of uh, our success. Um, we have very smart, problem-solving, passionate, nice, easygoing, amazing people, really amazing people to work with. Um, yeah, uh, we love our people. <laughs> and we really mean it when we say it like this. <laughs> okay, so yeah, you, you get the feeling, but uh, it gets really challenging to communicate uh, this uh, sentiment to, uh, to your client because um, every project manager, service delivery manager, call it whatever, um, actually comes to a point where uh, you have to somehow choose uh, we're, we choose sides actually is it the client or is it the team sometimes you have to be good and balance between the both sides um, but um, when you have the client as part of your team um, I think this this gets a lot easier so then you're taking care of the client as well as of your team and you don't really have to choose sides um, because everybody's working for the same goal and when you have that I think it's uh, a lot easier. Um, and when it comes to, to, if we do have to choose, I mean, we always cherish our people more and we, we will find some way uh, to, to overcome whatever the situation is. Um, together with our community, uh, with our uh, HR, we have adjusted a lot of processes around people to help people uh, to grow, uh, to feel good, to act upon uh, whatever is going immediately, to provide support uh, uh, immediately. Uh, so I think that is part of our, our culture. Um, and um, yeah, a couple of more things uh, when it comes to, to our people. <laughs> um, one of the first things uh, that uh, actually makes a difference in, uh, in, in our culture, in, in then it passes on to, to our team, um, is how we actually interact. Um, so what would be the power skills for you uh, that play difference in, in virtual teams? So teams that are not uh, physically collocated in one place. Um, I think the main one uh, for me is actually empathy. Um, well, the issue always with virtual teams is uh, there can be a lot of miscommunication because you don't see people, you don't know what they're saying, how they're feeling. Um, so just because you're not in the spa same space, um, you, you have to uh, think of this. And there always have to, has to be some kind of um, kindness in, in, in your interaction. Um, so everybody working uh, together to uh, ensure that you are always in the same page, uh, that you are all aligned at every moment uh, in time. Um, so in the phrase, like you, you have to be all in it together. And I know that this phrase of uh, all in it together, this has been washed out a lot in, in this pandemic era. Um, but I think uh, that over all, that all the teams over the world uh, who have been practicing this uh, are actually um, enabled uh, to, to, to do things better um, every day. <clears throat> so uh, for us, example, some examples of empathy uh, were really down to, to basic human uh, interactions, um, understanding when people need time to focus on their family, if they're working with kids, if they need time for their kids, uh, just to provide them uh, the, that feeling that you really understand them and that you are always there for them. Uh, no matter what happens uh, every day with delivery, with, uh, I don't know, story points, whatever, <laughs> you have to be uh, always ready to uh, understand what's going on and to provide support to your people. Uh, I think that is the most important thing. Um, um, the communication, next thing, has to be really clear. Um, 
in times where we have chat apps, uh, when we have different channels, we have virtual calls, uh, we must be absolutely clear about what our expectations, our goals, our targeted dates, uh, anything that we really want to happen, we, we need to be clear about that. Uh, try to avoid any assumptions that um, things go by without saying. Um, so nothing goes by without saying. You have to communicate that clearly and, and state out everything that you really want uh, to happen or any change that you want to see. Um, if you want to be on top of, uh, I mean, if you really want to have a high performing team, you have to be on top of your communication. I think that's, that's one of the, the, the most important things. Um, and um, overall, whatever the communication you are not seeing, as I said, uh, for, for us, when you don't see people, uh, people don't turn on the cameras even, uh, you always have to say the uh, something that you don't see and something that people actually didn't say. Uh, you have to uh, say that out loud. Uh, for me, that sometimes comes to um, asking stupid questions, like really irrelevant questions to people. How do you feel about this? The, does it make any sense for you? Just to get people to open up, to understand how they are feeling. Uh, I don't know if somebody was working late hours, I want to know that they were doing late hours and I would probably ask a bunch of uh, irrelevant questions to understand that. And uh, I think that um, if you don't get the communication, if you are not on top of this communication, a lot of things can just go by and uh, you will not be able to, uh, I mean, I would always go with uh, prevent uh, rather than uh, go and save whatever the mess was uh, after that. Uh, so for the culture, um, well, uh, people use this word really easily. <laughs> From my experience, this is our culture and then they do totally opposite things. Um, Pole table and fruits in the office. I mean, yeah, we have that, but that is not part of our culture. <laughs> I don't think that that is uh, something that uh, actually motivates people to work for you. But um, anyways, that's not the topic of, of this presentation. Uh, for us, uh, actually, the, we have a strong community um, in a sense that everybody is always there for everybody. So no matter what happens, the, there is always somebody who can help you and people are really keen on uh, being there for, 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 for their colleagues and, and, and support them. Um, uh, for us, uh, so it is not just about sending some perks uh, to people that you know that you, the company thinks of you when you are home, but also the, the fact that every day when you come to the work, there is always somebody who will listen up uh, for uh, your problems, uh, your, your worries, anything uh, that, that there, there's always somebody you can turn out to and uh, who will provide you support and just, just to hear you out at least. Um, this goes way beyond uh, whatever uh, the simple discussion is. We always try to act upon it. So as I said, there is no waiting in um, whatever your problem is. We will just uh, wait for the better times. No, we act like as soon as possible. And uh, the part of that culture is actually the culture of, of uh, giving and receiving feedback. Um, I think this was the most um, surprising question when I had on my interview when I, when I joined the company. But now from this experience, I can really say that we, uh, we really promote the culture of feedback uh, in a way that everybody is always um, able to provide feedback on anything that is going on. It, this starts from our management uh, and actually passes on to uh, each of our projects. Um, apart from the formal feedback where we have uh, uh, formal requested feedback from people uh, through their uh, individual development and, and uh, sessions with, with our HR, but also all kinds of informal feedback where people just give their opinion on everything that's going on. Um, and any change that is happening in the company, this goes uh, through feedback. So how do you feel about this changing? And do you think that we can do something better? Um, so every once in a while, we have some questions that pop up uh, somewhere in, in our Slack asking, how do you feel about the recent change? And is there something that we can do better? 
we try to promote that uh, in our project. So through a lot of um, one-on-one -on -one feedbacks and also through some kind of um, informal surveys, uh, trying to understand what's going on. How do people, people feel about change in our processes? Do they see that something uh, can be done better? And we always uh, listen to this and um, act upon it. Okay, so I've told you a little bit about our culture and how we did uh, with, the, with these teams. Um, actually, I wanted to go back to the start of this topic and uh, to, to actually understand what are, what are high performing teams. So what would be high performing uh, teams for you? Um, is it that the team's KPIs uh, are in some satisfying range? Um, is it that people are happy? Um, is it that uh, management is satisfied? Is it that uh, maybe you have a clear goal and uh, you de deliver value through your project or your product? Um, for us, actually, uh, there are quite a couple of things. Uh, what we actually consider a high-performing team uh, the first of the things is actually that everybody feels like part of the team. Um, so no matter if they just joined the team or they're here for a longer period, everybody feels like part of the team. And that is the most important thing. Uh, second is that we don't have dependency on one person in a way that if that person goes up off for a couple of days or forever, that the team will not manage and pull it through. Um, of course, everybody, when they join or leave the, the project, uh, the team actually, um, you, you cannot, um, they'll, they're, 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 there will always be some kind of change, but uh, at least we, we got to the point where if this happens, uh, we are not out of balance and we will not, uh, this will not significant, significantly impact uh, overall team's delivery. Um, we can easily replace anyone in the team with uh, different members from other teams or even from outside of the project. And uh, from the recent events that we have seen, um, this went without, uh, without any major uh, disturbance or, or uh, any uh, change in the uh, performance of, of our teams. Um, uh, the next thing is that we have steady throughput. Um, provide value through our delivery, uh, verified output from uh, our client. Um, all the metrics uh, are well understood and tied with our, proce with our processes. Um, the next thing is that we really practice transparency. We promote ownership and build trust uh, and open communication with the team. And we share all these values transparently with all the teams. Uh, we celebrate success no matter how small it is, and we give people recognition. Everybody gives recognition to everybody else in the team. Uh, I love the atmosphere. <laughs> uh, a lot of praises after every sprint and actually a lot of uh, improvement points also. So uh, I know the processes are, are functioning well. Um, and most importantly, we have people who are engaged uh, on a daily basis and motivated to grow. Um, not everybody is always motivated to grow, uh, but at least we know that people are there and they are ready to jump on and solve problems no matter what happens uh, every day. So yeah, I know maybe somebody will ask themselves, where, where is the client? For us, the client is part of the team um, and that's how we push things forward. Uh, and yeah, um, to spice it up, not everything is so super cool. Uh, our next challenge is actually bringing uh, two more teams from uh, client side. Uh, they're actually, we will actually have five cross-functional teams, um, a lot more challenges, uh, cultural differences, a lot more communication. Uh, but with all this experience, I think we, we have a really good uh, way forward. And yeah, that's all from my side. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you, Anita, for this great presentation. Uh, now we can officially start our Q&A section. Uh, so we just have someone who has raised the hand. So let's try that option, if that's OK with you. 
uh, night. Uh, I, uh, I have allowed you to talk so you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Right. Okay, I just sorry, double mute, of course. Um, <laughs> hi, Anita, thank you very much. Um, first, um, thank you for, for having us and um, obviously taking the time. If you don't mind, I have actually a few questions. <laughs> Go ahead. My first question was, I've noted it here for myself, um, what is a high performing team for you, but you have just explained it, which actually complements your presentation, so I'll move, move forward. Uh, my questions are going to be quite technical in a sense that um, I, I'm, um, you know, at the moment trying to move my team away from, from Scrum to more of a DevOps. So. Um, it was interesting to me when you said that your dev team was testing on your, you know, you, you guys trying to achieve automation. Do you know, did you guys um, have a decrease in quality? Sorry, I have my kids with me. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> no, that's okay. Asking. All of us are remote right now. So that's yeah, sorry about that. Uh, did you, did you um, catch my question? So. What I yeah. was wondering, yeah, is uh, obviously you do have some metrics and, and from what I understood you track quality. Did you see a decrease in quality once you have your dev team do the full cycle of testing? Yeah, actually we will have a new, full, uh, a new flow on this topic, but I will, uh, I will try to provide some insights uh, from my side here. Um, actually, when we did the switch in the process, we actually had, as I said, get more ownership to every developer over, over whatever they were doing. But actually, we didn't have decrease in quality. It was the opposite. Um, as our product owner was actually a little bit more involved, and that, that was kind of the um, different side of the cookie, as I would say. Uh, but um, if we didn't have that, I think we would have quite problem itself. So it was a calculated risk. And um, I think we managed to pull it through with actually all the metrics showing that the number of bugs uh, and the number of defects were actually a lot lower than earlier. Um, if you don't mind me asking, what are, what are the metrics that you guys have um, on your project? What is it that you keep an eye on? Yeah, great, great question. I have a slide for that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, these are actually some of the metrics that we used along the way. So not all of them are relevant for this uh, time, but uh, actually depending on what is bugging you, you create a metrics, uh, you create metrics to, to track that and uh, to see if you improved or not. At some point, uh, these were one a couple of uh, metrics actually. So it's related to productivity, uh, plan done, spilled, uh, velocity, et cetera. So these are some common uh, metrics that everybody I think uses. We just define them in some percentages that we want. Um, an example that we have no more than 8% uh, uh, story spilled so over sprint or, or something like that. Uh, at some time, we had uh, trouble with, uh, with the story size, so we got to uh, this metric and measured that uh, if we had at least 90% of the stories less than five story points, and I don't know, um, to go through all of them, uh, like recently we are tracking average time to resolve uh, defects from production. Uh, we track average uh, cycle time, create adversary resolve bugs, trends, etc. Um, my other field of interest is um, your deployment. You said you have your DevOps within the team, but you haven't really given us an idea what they mean. Are they focused on automation as well? Are they just build and release? How do they fit within the team and how often do you deploy? Yeah, uh, our DevOps actually take care of all the infrastructure and all the deployment related processes. Uh, I mean, they enable them, but developers are overall uh, responsible for releasing and deployments. Uh, how often we release? Well, that, that actually depends. Uh, that is one of the KPIs we are tracking recently. Um, we had releases for over, uh, for over the couple of months, and now we try to um, shorten the release cycle uh, to two, three sprints. And, and what is the, the branching strategy that you have? 
oh, don't go, please, don't go there. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> please, Fair enough. no. <laughs> Fair enough. And just one last question. Um, how do you, it was interesting to me that you said you had your QA do automation, but you tend to release MVP. How do you automate on an MVP level? I mean, do you have a lot of back and forths? Yeah, for the MVP, we actually didn't have any automation, as I said. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay. Anita, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Now we can go to our Q&A section. Anita, we have a few questions there, so you can cherry pick the one you like. Okay, so I need to at least stop sharing or something to get to these questions. Sorry. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, now we see the full <laughs> screen. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, so Adnan asked, uh, what was the total project duration? Uh, I guess this was, um, I don't know. So the, the project is alive for two years, I think, or something like that. And, and it will keep growing uh, and lasting, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, and did you have small releases after each sprint or did you release all changes in one single move to production release? Yeah, so as I said, we don't release after each sprint. Uh, we are not there yet. I think this is a lot dictating the type of features that are coming because we are still building the application. Uh, we have some features that are really uh, quite uh, bigger scope. Uh, so we cannot release them after each sprint. Uh, overall, the product owners or the client wouldn't see any value from that. Okay, I hope that answered <laughs> the question. Okay. <laughs> the process of feature delivery is uh, PO goes to architect, to developer, and to QA. Well, um, yeah, but uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, so product owners figure out what they really want. Uh, the architects provide the sizing, uh, developers, after the sizing, it goes to developer to grooming. And during this grooming, the, the feature also got, gets the chan chance to change because based on whatever the team is grooming and how they figure out the solution should be done, uh, this can also influence uh, how the feature actually looks like in the future. Uh, our QA are actually present in, um, in the whole part of uh, building the feature. So from the first grooming until the end and regression, they're always there. Uh, it doesn't just go in a way that we uh, as a developers finish uh, our task and then we push it on to the QA. It's actually more back and forth where, where uh, developers and QA together create uh, a product. Okay, I hope this also answers the question. <laughs> uh, Yasmina asked if we have three different POs for each functional team. No, actually we have a product team. Uh, we have, uh, thanks, <laughs> we have a um, group of product owners who work for the entire application. Um, sometimes uh, actually everybody's kind of involved with every feature. Uh, because uh, the product orders come from different, actually, um, also functional areas, I would say. <laughs> so they provide different insights into every feature that we built. Um, for, for us, for our team, we have a proxy product owner. Uh, we had it actually through the whole time. Uh, that was a person who was communicating everything uh, from the product team. And it was actually just a bridge in communication because our product owners were actually um, in a different time zone. So we needed uh, somebody who really understands the business logic and can uh, transfer it to the team, answer any question uh, during our time zone, during our working hours. So basically it's a group of product owners for, for all the three teams. Perfect. Uh, should we go to the next one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what is the dev to QA ratio in the team? Uh -huh. For every team, we have five developers and one QA. 
And uh, this was really, uh, this is a challenge that we are now also working on, uh, trying to increase the number of QAs to at least two per team so that we, um, actually the reasoning behind this is that we need a lot more automation and with this tempo we are of development we are not uh, able to actually uh, keep track with automation so th that's what we are doing currently so the number of questions is just raising and raising and uh, we have a few questions in our chat box so actually you can play a little bit and uh, choose from different uh, positions like we have few in chat box we have a uh -huh. lot of in our q a box so do what you want Anita. okay nobody raised the hand i like people uh, talking to people more <laughs> <laughs> so people anita encourage you to raise a hand we are now waiting for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay we will have the recording short, short super uh, uh -huh. my question is somewhat indirectly related to the cross-functional collapse but um how long does the onboarding process for one employee take in your company? Great question. We actually had new people joining the company and joining actually our team recently. And what we saw that people uh, became uh, like productive even from the second or third week. Um, I don't know, is it because we chose like very smart people, but uh, the whole environment is somehow um, set up in a way that it really helps people to get on track uh, really fast and, and very easily. We have a great onboarding program in our project. We, we have a lot of documentation, so not some documentation for, for the sake of itself, uh, but rather uh, useful documentation that help people to onboard faster. And uh, I think within the one month, we have people uh, working at their 100% speed. Uh, and of course, in the whole process, we have a great community that helps people on board. We have a great support from HR and everybody around uh, who is actually working with people to help them adjust and, and you know, feel good and just work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who triggers the release and who decides when is it enough? When is enough changes done to be released? Uh, so the release is actually triggered by product owners. They are the one who say we are now happy with everything that is done. Let's uh, let's release this. Um, and who decides when is it enough changes to be? Uh huh. So yeah, mostly well uh, for our uh, release. Actually, product owners, these are the people who are responsible for any change uh, and the overall release date. We are there to, to say when it can be done and they are the ones to say when to go uh, to production. Okay. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions in the Q&A section. I think you answered some of them on the go, but just review them one more time. Thank yeah. you, Merima, for keeping track of this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, we have one raise the hand, so maybe we can go oh, there just yeah. to... <laughs> Please. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't feel like talking to myself. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, so don't, don't matter. It, we, uh, I think maybe it was a mistake because I don't see the raise hand right now. After that. Sorry, Anita. Back to the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, okay, next question. How much is important metric? And did you see it uh, to improve process for next future sprints? Hmm. Okay, so for the metrics, actually uh, we track them every sprint. Some of the metrics are, are really indicators from sprint to sprint and some metrics are indicator from release to release depending on what what we are tracking uh, but we actually use everything that uh, that we measure we really use it to improve our processes it's not just something that keeps uh, you know that we keep on confluence or anywhere 
it's something that we really use to improve our processes. Um, we also ask for feedback from people and we, uh, so not just metrics, but also uh, you have to take into account all the, all the key factors that influence your delivery and um, yeah, work, work to, to um, get better. <laughs> Perfect. I will release that question. So just to make preview easier for you. So all the questions you answered, actually, you can see them anymore there in the answer section. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we are supporting you. We are talking all the time about this. So <laughs> I love you. <laughs> we love you too. <laughs> we are like a uh, hippie commune. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have anonymous question. Um, I like this one. In your opinion, what would be the key guidelines to rationalize the communication, meeting and calls in particular, mainly in order to enable teams time in less fragmented by providing different updates, etc. Yeah, so this is also a really um, good question. I mean, since the communication is 90% of, I think, of, of my time, um, and I always try to uh, leave the space for people who really don't need to attend any of the meeting that they don't. Uh, I encourage people to uh, separate the blocks of hours in their schedule uh, so that nobody would uh, get, uh, you know, a meeting in, the, in their calendar. For the developers, uh, the, actually the meetings and the amount of meetings and this amount of uh, communication is really low because they only attend uh, all the meetings that are um, you know prescribed by, by scrum so they have daily meetings uh, refinements um, also uh, sprint planning and demo so that that's like the basic uh, meetings that they need to attend to and uh, there are always one-on-one short things where people discuss about technicalities of, of uh, development, uh, but we really don't push people to attend any more meetings that they need. That this is the key actually that helped the team. So every people, every, every person in a small team actually don't feel the burden of the overall communication. Uh, for the majority of the meetings that I said uh, that in the previous slides, uh, they actually applied only to delivery people. So delivery people such as myself, uh, our architect, scrum master and product owner. Uh, for the rest of the meetings, uh, we always try to uh, leave time for people to be efficient and not to just hang around some meetings and lose, uh, lose their productivity listening to things that don't concern them. Perfect. So the number of questions is just rising. Uh, I think that we have actually time for this, but uh, just so we can go and pick it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, ha -ha. So how did you handle cross team features? Uh, yeah. Um, so Grooming together where we know, for example, that some features are really connected. Uh, technical architect is included in those groomings, tech leads and uh, some of the team members, not all. We also try not to, uh, as I said, not, not get the people on meetings where they would feel um, unproductive. Um, so figure out the dependencies between the features, figure out what needs to be changed, uh, figure out where uh, somebody needs to wait for somebody else. Um, it, some part of the system needs to be um, developed uh, before the another team uh, had to pick up on their own feature. This is actually a lot of uh, just deliberate communication and understanding what's going on in the planning phase. Um, so that's how we prevent any damages uh, and rework and any situations where we would feel like uh, losing time uh, later on. Fala, <laughs> Amra. Okay. Uh... Uh, 
uh, do you use any user usability research? All the features come from the client's product owners. Yeah, actually, this is something that the client dictates uh, because um, they have a specific industry uh, where our developers and we don't have experience. Actually, this was one of the first uh, projects in this industry that we worked for. Uh, so our product owners and their design team actually sit together and uh, figure out what what um, their users want, what they need, and what we need to uh, what we need to work on, what would be our next features and and priorities. Uh, okay. Um, thanks, Milica. <laughs> All of the challenges you mentioned that uh, your team faced, which was one of the hardest to overcome in your opinion and why? Thank you. Uh, yeah. I think uh, the biggest challenge was actually to getting to this feeling that we are one team. <laughs> um, I came to the, you know, I came to uh, be a part of this uh, project in remote work and for me it was really challenging to get to know all the people and let alone to be on top of the, the delivery um, and you know getting to know all the people getting to know them what they want what what worries them what is their goal uh, where did they see themselves growing um, I think that was the hardest uh, part for me uh, it took some time to get the team's trust uh, to get their trust into whatever we, we are doing. Um, yeah, that, that was the biggest challenge for me. So maybe to wrap it up, I will just give you like uh, the option to pick five uh, most uh, interesting questions for you. Because I think I think that the number is only rising, which says a lot about your presentation. Uh, and thank you for answering all of these questions. But let's wrap it up with the last five questions. Which okay, you fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still hoping that somebody will raise hand. <laughs> we are waiting for uh, the courage one. <laughs> Okay, super. Um, Leila asked, how do you organize review demo sessions with the client? Who is attending them? How do you prepare them, uh, ETC? Although they are the cherry on the cake at the end, they can be very stressful for the team. Hmm. Well, we came to the point where I don't think this is a stress for the team. Uh, we have some kind of list of who does the demo next sprint and people uh, can prepare upfront um, what they need to show. And they organize themselves uh, in, inside a team, what should be shown at the demo, what shouldn't be shown, what is completed, what is not, what, uh, what makes uh, sense to show. Uh, sometimes it's not just part of the, uh, part of the code that was um, developed during the sprint. Sometimes it's uh, something related to metrics, something related to automa automation. So anything that we really made a progress on during the last sprint. Um, people prepare for them just by talking to their uh, fellow mates, uh, what they did, what, what was interesting at the, in their part of the code, what would be um, fun to see for the client, what would make value. Uh, so that's basically how, how we organize demos. Um, and everybody attends them. So on these demos we have, uh, so now it's around 40 people on, on demo, <laughs> it happens. Uh, every uh, every second week, um, everybody's seeing what everybody else is doing, and we just talked uh, of how we can um, make this even better now with clients teams uh, joining uh, the delivery uh, uh, delivery uh, teams um, just to have them as well on these on these demos to to see what everybody else is doing, just to provide some transparency and uh, the big picture of what's going on. <laughs> every 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 spent okay um how do you resolve conflicts that happen during tight schedule and short deadlines in example blame game between stakeholders and development team uh this is a good one <laughs> Yeah, I can tell you an example that when we get to situations where 
so how how we get to um, the point where we decide what is a what is a, our release date or or what is our deadline let's call it like that so after people sit together and understand what they need to deliver they figure out when it can be done so i actually get uh get the team uh to be really responsible for what they are saying so if they are 100 uh include uh, you know on top of whatever they are estimating and they know what they are doing um i really believe them that we will not get into a situation where we would have to fight for for uh, for our lives in, 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 in the last uh, couple of weeks. But um, on the other hand, if we, if we do have, get this situation where uh, we have a tight um, uh, deadline and we have little time to finish whatever is, le is left, uh, it should be you know, for, for a reason why we got here. So somebody made a mistake along the way. And uh, for us, we try to really avoid uh, the blame game. Um, this, we see this as opportunity to, uh, to learn. So everybody has um, you know, that right to make a mistake. Uh, we don't uh, punish people for making mistakes. We figure out how we can uh, learn from this. And my job overall is actually to go to, go to the client and uh, either negotiate a different timeline or provide reasoning why this happened and really to try to find some middle ground uh, with the client how we can resolve this. Um, I didn't have any negative experiences so far. So I think the most important thing is just uh, to be open and transparent about this. And I, I think that we have a people who, who are committed to what they do and they have the ownership of their part of the work. Uh, and that means that even they are doing something that led to this mistake, they will always uh, come forward and say, this was my uh, mistake. I'm sorry, I will never do that again. And uh, we try to um, actually share whatever we learn with everybody else so that we don't get into this situation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How much more, Slavica? Three more, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay, three more. Uh, what are the three biggest challenges you face on a daily basis in the cross-functional team and how do you approach solving those? Wow. The biggest challenge is when I wake up in the morning and come to the meeting and I'm all hype and very uh, in a very good mood and people don't like that. <laughs> it's, it's something that I still haven't overcome. <laughs> I know they hate me for it. <laughs> Uh, but that's part of the culture as well, what can I say? <laughs> uh, for the challenges, uh, like mostly the communication is always a challenge. Uh, you have to be on top of it, but it's always uh, something that you need to work on. And uh, how do you solve it by being transparent and just saying what's going on? You know, uh, that, that, that is, you cannot get that like perfect. You, you always fail at that, no matter how great you are in communicating, there, there will always be a gap. Um, and also one of the things is that um, hmm, it's actually just around, you know, getting to know people, uh, to understand how they're thinking, uh, to provide them the best possible support. Sometimes I uh, catch myself in, you know, trying to work on something that nobody asked me to do. Uh, and that is because I try to make assumption what is that person uh, thinking because they're not saying what they should be saying. Uh, that's the nature, human nature. So that is also something that that I'm sometimes struggling with, not every day, but sometimes and still learning uh, from that experience. Oh, this is a great technical one. I shouldn't be talking about this. <laughs> How do you handle hot fixes? Is there an automation in place to handle those potential major issues that need instant deployment a couple of times per day if needed? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that is the reason why we built the automation. We turn it on every time we want to push something to production. How do we handle them? Well, in a way that uh, whatever needs to go to hotfix goes to hotfix uh, automation in place, um, you know, um, 
communicating this to product owners, to everybody who, who, uh, who has the power of saying when something should go to, to uh, production. And we don't actually have any challenges uh, with this. This was kind of a smooth process for us uh, for, for a long time now. Okay, so you have the last one and choose wisely. I always wanted to say this. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to me carefully. I should say this only once. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, this was an interesting one. Um, so um, I wanted to ask whether you have any tips on uh, or methods that you have used to bring the client on board with being part of the team and the team uh, reconstruction in general. Or in general, uh, what was the process concerning the client like? Um, yeah, from from the first moment, I actually figured out that if we if we want to make this happen, we have to get the client uh, onboarded and on and on our side. And we were really happy that after delivering that uh, big scope, the client trusted us that we do things uh, that we know what we are doing actually. Um, so from our side, uh, actually, what helped us is uh, to get in a little bit more into uh, whatever their industry is to what they are doing and try to provide some added value there uh, to figure out how we can reach out uh, to their uh, end users, their customers, and how we can uh, actually build better products for their customers. So everybody kind of stepping up to understanding uh, a little bit more about business logic. And from the first time when we provided uh, some small actually insights in, into this process. Uh, they felt like that we we understand their pain uh, and that uh, we understand them and that we are one, one part of the same team. So this was actually one of the the uh, the, the one <laughs> trick that that, that I would use any time. So that's is it? that all? <laughs> that's all. That was the last one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Anita, uh, for your patience, for uh, answering thoroughly to each question, and for your dedication, and for uh, saying congratulations and uh, uh, let's say mentioning community thing. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> <laughs> we love you so much. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want also to thank to all of all of the people who participated in our discussion uh, and uh, uh, I, 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 I want to say that I like when the, uh, he, when the Q&A section is heated up and that's why we are doing this so thank you for staying uh, with us this late and participating in, uh, in the discussion uh, thank you for your knowledge sharing <laughs> Anida uh, this was the third uh, March Up event as I already mentioned we have two more next week. Uh, they are coming from Novi Sad and Nish. Our Yelena and Milica are bringing amazing presentation uh, from DevOps point of view and uh, from service delivery view again. So I uh, inviting you to join us next week as well. Um, on, Monday, on Monday, Yelena will be talking about Jen Jenkins pipelines for mic microservices. So uh, I think that it, it's really interesting topic for DevOps, but for engineers as well. So join us and learn something new. And that would be all. I don't know if uh, Marima has something, something to add. Something else. Just to thank you, just to thank you, Anita, for an amazing presentation. I think it was very uh, knowledgeable for everybody, and we, we everybody learned a lot. And it was really interesting. The Q and A session was on fire. <laughs> I think, I think we can leave maybe even your email for further discussions. Um, so yeah, you were amazing, and thanks everybody for participating. We'll see you next week. <laughs>
Yeah, I just want to mention a few more things so that you are not concerned. You will get uh, the follow-up email with the presentation uh, and the recording of this event. And please, uh, if you attended and if you are here, you attended this event, please fulfill our survey. We want to learn more uh, to be better each time we organize these events. So it's just a few minutes for you, but it means a lot of uh, a lot to us. So please answer to our survey and and we will upgrade our events even more. If we can do that after, after this presentation, Anita, <laughs> if that's even possible after that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, thank you everybody for listening and for, for attending uh, this um, interesting session. Uh, thank you guys for having me here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and anybody else who have any other questions, feel free to uh, reach out, LinkedIn, email, whatever. I'll be more than happy to talk about this topic. I, I, you cannot see that I'm not passionate about it. <laughs> you are living this. You are living this. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. See you next week. I hope to see you on Monday. And uh, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.